I'm Scott Owen Miller, and this is Pickles. And this is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I'm going to be doing some viewer questions because I've been in Managua with my kids doing a food and shopping tour of the city as we like to do. My wife was busy with construction oversight with one of our hotels, and so uh, my daughters decided that it was just going to be the three of us, so we went and hung out and had a father-daughter uh, weekend, except it was not actually the weekend. Uh, in Managua, we had a really good time. I'm going to fill you in a little bit on what we did. I did not film that. I'm not going to be showing anything just because my kids do not like being on the show, but I'm going to be talking about what we did, and today's question, the primary one from my viewers, is Am I enjoying Nicaragua? Which may seem like a funny question to my regular viewers, but I think it's a good one uh, to answer. We're going to be answering some other questions as well, so stay tuned. We'll get to those questions and more right after the bump. All right, we're going to leave our big stuff until the end. To keep you guys in suspense, my first question from Jed Red. Lay <laughs> is do they have an Arthur's fish and chips there? Referring to Nicaragua. For those who don't know, what he's actually referring to is Arthur Treacher's fish and chips, and this was a really important chain, important I guess, a chain of fish and chips places uh, that opened in I don't even know. Um, it was a, a character actor named Arthur Treacher, born in 1894. Uh, it was named after him, and I don't know when it actually started. I believe 1969, I'm reading some of this, uh, as National Fast Food Corp uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and it was uh, uh, actually tied to Wendy's in the early days. It was uh, not directly... Um, uh, from them, but they, they had some connections. And the person who started it was connected with Kentucky Fried Chicken before that. So there's a lot of, like, during that time, a lot of these food places were connected. Not super important. What's important, I don't know why this question was asked, right? I have zero context of why this question was asked. I don't know who knows Arthur Treacher's fish and chips. So, weird. But it's meaningful to me. So... Uh, we're just going to assume that this was a magical question, but I'm going to try my best to actually post the question so you guys can see that I didn't just pull this out of nowhere. So, Arthur Treacher's, when I was a little kid, I grew up in, uh, if you really want to know, Peoria, New York, uh, which is the place Peoria, Illinois, is named after a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's not even, it's a crossroad technically in New York, but my mailing uh, zip code was Pavilion. And uh, my local tiny city, which is not like a real city, no one would claim this, was Batavia, New York. That's where I got my first driver's license. That's where my library was. I did a ton of things in Batavia. Now, it's hard to believe that growing up, Batavia was a town that I was somehow attached to in any way whatsoever. When I go there, though, it's a really important part of my childhood. And so many childhood memories are connected to that, partially because that was my local hospital. Uh, that's where I had my appendix out when I was older. That's where we used to go to restaurants all the time. That's where our local mall was when I was little. That's where um, uh, uh, the library, again, and I went to the library a lot. When I was little, my mother and I made regular trips to the library. She would go to Batavia for all kinds of things because um, just we had to as our local uh, city for a lot of things. So, um, uh, Arthur Treacher's had a branch in Batavia, New York when I was growing up, and this was one of my mother's favorite places. So this is where I learned to eat fish and chips. Uh, this was a, you know, when I was really little, this is one of the main fast food kind of places that my family would go to. Uh, loved it. Um, it's where I learned to eat shrimp. It's where I learned to eat fried fish. It's just a lot of things, right? So I have this really, and, and my mother has been gone now uh, for over 20 years, so I have this real emotional connection to Arthur Treacher's fish and chips, and it disappeared from my home market in Western New York long ago. I was, I, I would imagine by the time I was in middle school, it was already gone. But when I was younger than that, it was just, it was just really, you know, it, growing up in most of America, you know, kind of towards my age, you might picture McDonald's and Wendy's and Burger King and, um, uh, you know, all pre Taco Bell, uh, but KFC, Pizza Hut, those are places that we pretty much all knew. Growing up where I did, Arthur Treacher's was just another one like those. I had no idea it wasn't just as big as those. Um, so this question is funny, though, because uh, Arthur Treacher's disappeared uh, when I was young, but that because it, it really peaked in the 70s uh, and had 826 stores, actually. Um, but now there's only a couple 
uh, locations left in the world. There's uh, one in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, which is about where it started. Um, and then of all places, my hometown of Rochester, New York, where I was born, has four attached to Salvatore's pizzerias. Um, so there's only a few in the world, but they're from my hometown at this point for all intents and purposes. Um, there's some like franchise stuff supposedly going on, but all the websites and stuff are old. Basically, there's something like seven or eight kind of locations as of 2023 that still exists in the world, but it's very loose. Like, I guess there's still a, a core organization to these, but it's it's basically gone out of business. There's just one or two that are left out of nostalgia. Um, but there was a time when my wife and I were recently married, um, or a few years, we moved down to New York City, and at that time, Arthur Treacher's had a little comeback uh, and opened some locations along the New York State Thruway, which is a really weird thing to have done. And so we got to go to them. So my wife had never seen one because they were never that big, uh, even though she grew up not that far from me. And so I got to take her to one. And a few times we went out to Arthur Treacher's Fish and Chips together, uh, which was which was cool and an unbelievable throwback for me. Of course, it isn't the same, but it was good. It was nice to go back and know that I did. And now they're essentially gone. Um, if I now that I know that they're in Rochester and like nowhere else, basically, um, I might stop by and, and, and go to one uh, if, the, if the opportunity arises, uh, or maybe I can get my dad to go and film one, although it's not great for his health to eat that, so probably not a great idea. Maybe he'll get someone to go on his behalf and film it and show you guys in Arthur Treacher's, but is there one in Nicaragua? No, they only exist in New York and Ohio, and even there, it's only a technicality for them to still exist. Just a very funny thing to have been asked on my channel at all, um, and, and I'm sure it was tongue in cheek because they don't exist anywhere, but how someone knew that I would even figure out that they meant Arthur Treacher's or why they would think I knew anything about it, um, I have no idea, but I certainly do. I know them very well and, uh, wouldn't it be cool if they were here? However, I now own restaurants that do fish and chips and I had fish and chips on the day of this being asked, which is the day I'm recording it, which is probably the day you're seeing it. So I had fish and chips today here. We get that here. It's not Arthur Treacher's Fish and Chips, but at El Simple, at the Simple Beach Lodge in Las Penitas, the fish and chips aren't that different. They're, they're along that, uh, that way. All right, next question we have up from Mohammed Abdullah Aden Mohammed. Uh, Dear boss, when I get rich in Nicaragua, can I afford to go to Mexico? So I'm not exactly sure what's being asked here, um, but it seems like a simple one to, to answer. I mean, if you are living in Nicaragua and you're doing okay financially, Mexico is very close, right? So um, even if you're on a pretty strict budget, getting up to um, getting up to Mexico is uh, pretty easy. You can do so by bus. We also have direct flights, right? Iro Mexico to, to CDMX to Mexico City, very easy. Um, obviously, Mexico is much more expensive than Nicaragua. But if you are doing quite well financially in Nicaragua, of course, Mexico would be affordable. Uh, but Mexico is one of the least affordable countries in the region, certainly more affordable than Costa Rica, and a little bit more affordable than Panama, but it's more in their category. Um, it's nothing like, you know, US and Canada, they're really expensive. Um, but even Mexicans are starting to, in pretty large numbers, move to other countries just because it's lower cost of living. Not that they can't afford Mexico, but why afford Mexico if you're able to move, right? Same as leaving US or Canada, a lot of us who leave could afford to stay, but there's a obvious draw to why pay a lot to be able to stay when you could pay a whole lot less to be somewhere else, right? So that's always a factor. Um, so I, I don't know what would make you want to go to Mexico. I mean, I know why I want to go to Mexico. It's a sweet country, right? Like there's a lot of reasons to want to be in Mexico, but there's a lot of reasons to want to be in Nicaragua. So I have no idea what, what the basis is here, but if it's purely a financial thing, yes, if you're doing financially well in Nicaragua, then you'll have no problem in Mexico uh, whatsoever. Um, okay, so um, I did some filming um, of, so I'm going to show some of this. I, I filmed some of our drive uh, to and around uh, Managua. So I'm going to play some of that in the background um, while we're doing some of uh, the topics today. So the first portion is just us driving into Managua on the old road, uh, which is the, the southern road that comes into the south side of the city and allows us to go straight onto the piece of suburbana and make our way uh, east in the city, uh, out to, uh, out, out to the, the, uh, Santo Domingo area. 
All right. So Dodd Orich asked the question. You made a mention of pet friendly businesses. Are grocery stores typically pet friendly in your videos? I haven't noticed anyone walking their leash dogs. Uh, so grocery stores are generally not going to be pet friendly. Having animals indoors in like American style supermarkets, not going to go over well. Like that, I, I, could you potentially bring one in? I mean, Nicaragua in general has so, such a loose approach to allowing animals places, um, but that's in general not going to work because, I mean, let's just face it, dogs are going to pee on things. Like it's an indoor area. It's super clean. It's a food prep area. It's not like, you know, outdoor markets, of course, but not grocery stores. Um, you know, they're air conditioned and, and animals getting into people's baskets and stuff like you can just imagine there'll be all kinds of problems. Um, I think you would feel really awkward trying to do that. Uh, and, and people would be really upset if you did, even if the store allowed you. So I don't think that that would ever really um, work. It just it seems very strange. Now, um, walking leashed dogs, there isn't a lot of that, but partially there, there's a lot of reasons why you're not seeing it. One is people don't tend to leash their dogs. A lot of dogs are, are left off leash, but most of the dogs are wild. So you're going to see a lot of dogs that are not someone's dogs or they're marginally someone's dog. Someone may let them stay at their place or maybe feeds them from time to time or gives them shelter, but not, not food, just, just provides water or whatever. There's a lot of wild or semi wild dogs. That's what you see all over the place. So of course, no one's walking them on leash. They just wander where they want to go, uh, which is super sad. And one of the things more than anything that I wish we could correct here in Nicaragua and find homes for all those dogs, get them treated and spayed and neutered and all kinds of things and healthy and happy and safe and and with families that would be the best thing that's not an easy task um so you're not going to see a lot of people walking leash dogs with them because dogs are loose all the time all over the place even people who have dogs don't often walk them on leash of course when you find people who are really taking care of their animals they're going to have them on leash same as anyone else so I see people walking leash dogs on a semi-regular basis. It's not an oddity. It's not like, oh my gosh, someone has a dog on a leash, but it is not the norm. Local dogs have a very high survival rate because their DNA has, has evolved to, to have to avoid traffic. Um, but like our dogs, every time I walk them, they're always on leash. Right. I know other people who walk their dogs always on leash. Um, there's just, uh, it, it's, you don't want to be off leash. Um, if you you know, because your dogs are going to be introduced to a lot of diseases that you can't prevent, and then you have to treat them, and a lot of times it's, it's not good, right? So you really want to make sure that they're staying on leash uh, most of the time, which is unfortunate. But where can you not have dog? You know, but it's easy to have big yards here, right? So um, so there are benefits. That's that's our approach. Is having leashed dogs all the time was was problematic and so we just went for really big yard and now they run around we very rarely put them on leash they sometimes um, but mostly they just run around to their heart's content they have tons of space to explore tons of space to run room to play um, and it works really well i think and it keeps them very very safe uh, and very healthy and uh and free to just go out and do stuff anytime they want outside so that's been i think really good overall uh, but are there lots of dogs on leash? No. Can you walk your dog on a leash and not have people think you're crazy? Yeah, that won't be a problem. Edward Bernardson asks, lower cost of shelter? Now, this is in reference to a video where we talked about some of the benefits of Nicaragua compared to especially North America, but it could have been lots of places. This was about can I afford to live in Nicaragua. Uh, so we mentioned that the cost of shelter, housing, and so forth in Nicaragua is much lower than basically anywhere you're going to evaluate, and that is... Of all the cost analysis of Nicaragua, you know, the cost of like food and uh, transportation and different basic necessities, generally Nicaragua is low. But the one spot where Nicaragua is really low is typically shelter. So that's its slam dunk as far as the cost of living comparison goes. There's a lot of things it's good at, but it, it gets so much advantage from how cheap its housing is that that is what generally holds it at nearly or absolutely the best as far as cost of living in the Western Hemisphere. So his question, uh, lower cost of shelter? Is it in part due to less red tape? In Canada, everything is regulated. There are rounds of inspections by various agencies in the name of safety. When I look at Jamaica or Sri Lanka, for example, you can put up whatever structure you want on that land that you own. Try that in Ontario and see what happens to your shelter. Can you briefly touch on what builders in Nicaragua face when constructing a home? So yes, I mean, the, so the easy answer to the first part is yes. One piece of why shelter costs less in Nicaragua is a low level of red tape. 
Um, there is some red tape, of course. I don't know anywhere that has none. Um, you do need, if you're going to put up a house, for example, you do need a building permit, generally. Very cheap, very easy. Um, you normally have to tell them, you know, I'm putting up a house, some real basic detail, but that's kind of, kind of it, right? Um, there are places you'll be building, like if you're in a city, you're going to have more scrutiny if you're on a farm somewhere, much less scrutiny. And at some point, realistically, I'm sure no one's getting permits for certain types of things. Obviously, a lot of Nicaraguans who are putting up just basically lean-to shelters, they're not getting permits. Um, you know, in some cases, it may be ask for, for, for forgiveness rather than uh, permission. But as an expat, if you're looking at moving into Nicaragua, realistically, you're going to need to have basic permissions for doing construction. So don't be surprised if there's something. Uh, but um, as someone who's who's been through some of this and know a lot of people who've been through it, what we generally see is yes, you do have to have a permit for basic things if you want to add a new floor, especially if you're in a you know high visibility, high traffic area such as a beachfront or the city. Absolutely, you're going to have to have a city engineer kind of make sure your structure is viable, right? They don't want it coming down on people. Um, if it's your own house and you're building it yourself and no one's really around you. Technically, you definitely need a permit. Is anybody actually going to care if you were to go and build your own house and do it out of the way and no one's watching? I guess most likely not, but that's purely a guess, and I'm not saying you should do that. But what I'm really saying is that the amount, the cost and time to the red tape is super minimal, and you'll be really silly to be skipping it. Like, just do what you're supposed to do, and you'll be like, oh, that was so easy, why was I worried? Right, but I totally get it. Coming from the US, which is nothing like Canada, it's so much work and risk and problems from all that red tape. And I know Canada is just so much worse, right? So this will be an extreme for you. You'll be like, whoa. But importantly, that's also not the primary reason why it's so much less expensive. It's a reason it contributes to the lower cost, but other things that contribute to lower cost, just to give you kind of a background picture. One, the cost of land here is low, especially right now, for a lot of reasons. One, it's a huge country with a low population, or at least low population density. So think Texas. Even though there's a lot of people in Texas, there's not a lot of people per mile in Texas. So land remains relatively low in the majority of Texas, not downtown Austin, but you know what I mean. If you want to be right around the Capitol in Managua, like I mean the Capitol building, sure, land's going to cost more. Still kind of affordable though, but areas that you would never be able to afford in like Austin. Oh, I want to be right downtown Austin. That'll be $10 million for a tiny little plot of land, right? It won't be like that. You could be walking distance to anything in Managua. And while it might get pricey, it'll never get to some insane number. Uh, so, so the cost of land is just really low. There's no specific spot in the country. Um, I mean, there may be like one or two little tiny lots, but 99.999% of the country has uh, just really low land costs because someone can just buy up the street or somewhere. There's just always something available. Uh, and and there, there aren't that many people clamoring for the land. Uh, there just isn't that much need for new construction. So that keeps land prices down, along with a general exodus of the middle working class that has been going on for the last few years. This means that the people who are most likely to be buying or building new houses are often leaving the market. So there's a noticeable decrease in that part of the market right now. That is depressing the buying and building markets, leaving a lot of houses available. So both very low demand for land in general, but specifically now even lower than normal, so that it's even depressed from, from norm. And uh, existing houses, so this doesn't apply to building, but it applies to getting shelter, uh, existing houses are below the cost of building and have been for years. So in many cases, you can buy a pre-built house because there's low demand for those as well, a dropping demand. Even though the population is not dropping, the number of people who are living multi-generationally in a single house is increasing. Now the middle class is, is coming up, so there, there's gonna be some give and take on this, but in general, that house buying demographic isn't expanding the way that it normally would, and so you have an opportunity to get houses that people just don't need in many cases. Now there's always some amount of that, but now there's more of that. So the overall existing housing market, not the land market, but the housing market has come down in price. So that makes general shelter a little bit cheaper. Now, if you're going to build, that pressure doesn't help you, but there isn't as much work going around. So the cost of labor for building a house, a little bit low, just a tiny bit, like that doesn't vary too much. And supplies for building, you know, wood and, and concrete and nails and those things are basically 
normal. They're, they're not up or down up, up for the most part. So can you build cost effectively? Yes. So the overall reasons why the cost of shelter is low is that there are market pressures that are making it depressed compared to normal, both for existing houses and for land. Building is basically at normal prices. Uh, there's very low red tape. And overall, the biggest cost in constructing a house, whether it's in the US or Canada or Europe, whatever, generally comes from labor. And to some degree, the red tape and engineering studies and, and those things, which are kind of labor. And then the materials are not actually the majority of the cost. They're a big piece, but they're not generally the majority. Uh, in this case, they're not inflated particularly, and the cost of labor is already super low and possibly a little bit below average because of the lack of demand. So because of the incredibly low cost to construct a house, even building is just generally cheap and pre-existing is cheaper than that. Uh, so those are the, the big p factors as to why you're going to find that shelter in Nicaragua just is a low cost thing uh, in, in, for the most part. Now, as final question, can you briefly touch on what builders in Nicaragua face when constructing a home? So I think we, we pretty much covered it, right? It's got a very little bit and I'm not a construction expert, so I don't deal with this directly and, and I don't want to get into details because I'm sure to get them wrong and they will vary based on a lot of factors. What city you're in, what departmental you're in, are you on indigenous land, are you not on indigenous land, um, are you dealing with a lawyer who's overseeing things, uh, you know, are you in a city in the country? A lot of things will play into this, so I don't want to get into specifics, but uh, generally, a builder doesn't have a lot they have to deal with. You're going to want to have a lawyer for sure. Uh, you're going to need to get um, basic clearance from the Alcadia. That's your municipal oversight. They're going to need to give you permission to build. That's generally incredibly simple. Like, unless you're doing something super crazy. Oh, you're building on protected land? No, you can't do that. Um, but you're building on normal land? Knock yourself out, right? And then my understanding is quite often you need to have um, certain checks from uh, engineering. And this often comes from the Alcadia as well. So the mayor's office basically uh, can assign you an engineer who just goes out and is like, yeah, this house is stable. Oh, it's, uh, you know, a first floor little one room thing. I don't care. Like, who cares? Here you go. Um, and, uh, and, and then construction teams are just going to go get material from uh, the, the hardware stores or lumber stores or whatever it is that you need. Um, not, a lot of, not a lot of hoops in general. Now, any given specific situation, maybe you need to hook up to municipal water, municipal sewer, maybe you have to dig a well. All those things will have a little bit of their own stuff, but Generally, I would say, you know, get someone who has built homes before and knows what to do and get a lawyer who knows what needs to be done and will oversee the basics for you, making sure you have all your permits and stuff um, in, in uh, uh, ducks in a row kind of stuff. But really not hard. Those pieces, having worked on that stuff myself in the past here, um, they're, they're basically non-issues. We know we have to go have permission before we do stuff, but it's not, we've never tried to do something crazy. We're not trying to do something that will fall down. We're not trying to, you know, cut corners or anything like that. So, you know, the kind of things we run into are, oh, we, we, maybe we'd like to construct this taller than the local ordinances allow. Okay. Okay. No, nope, you're going to have to have special permission to go above this height or something. Okay. That's like a very specific thing because very specific areas have some limitations like that. And we're aware of it. Uh, but if you're just building your own house, like, you know, on a farm somewhere, you're in a small village, you just want to build a thing. The, the chances that unless you're trying to build something that's out of like matchsticks, uh, they're going to just be like, yep, it's your money, build what you want to build. This is safe for the community. We don't care. That That's basically what it comes down to. So they, they have, and it's exactly what you want. You don't want zero oversight. That's reckless, right? You don't want something falling and hitting people in the street. You don't want to damage the house next to you. You don't want people who stay at your house or who buy it in the future to be in danger. So they want to cover those things. But as far as does your house make sense? Is it good for the neighborhood? Is it a lot of things? They're just like, you know, it's your money, it's your land, do what you want to do. That is, that's the basic approach. So without specifics, um, your builders are going to have very little delay on that. Your lawyer can normally get most of that done ahead of time, and it's only right when you're about to start construction and you actually have the plans. That's the one moment that you may have to wait for someone to actually say, okay, you can start on this, this makes sense. Uh, but even then, you can probably clear land and get that kind of stuff ready while that's going on anyway, so it doesn't necessarily uh, represent a delay. 
It's not super specific, so I'm sorry. I, this is not an area of expertise, even though I've done it before, but I do know it is not an area we have to worry about. We never go into these things and say, oh no, we're gonna have to so my battery died there, sorry. So it's not the kind of thing, we really don't worry about getting the permits, about anything like that. We're doing sensible things. We wanna build a structure we'd wanna live in. It's just a really quick process. It doesn't hit us from a time perspective or a money perspective as a thing that we need to worry about. So yeah, I think it's gonna be uh, just fine, not, not something that you'll probably need to worry about either. Uh, so Joe Clara asks, Scott, how do you go about finding a full-time driver and maid service in Nicaragua? Well, this is a tough one because how do you find people for anything anywhere, right? Staffing positions of any sort can be difficult for us, right? We've been here a long time, so we have a lot of resources for things. So we have a list, one could say a laundry list, but that would be very, very punny, um, of, of people who are interested in doing these kinds of things. So we have multiple handymen who, who are also drivers. Uh, we have uh, multiple people who work for us as maids. And so shuffling people through our hotels and, and home, or whatever, for maid service is very easy. We also uh, have connections, right? We have people like our lawyer, for example, who often knows people. People will come to her looking for work. Um, and we're known in the community, so people come and, and ask for work as well. So having been here for a little while, it's very simple. Are you going to find like a job posting board where people list what they're available for and what you might be looking for? No, that's not going to be something you find. Um, it's all going to come down to where are you living? What are you looking for? Um, how long have you been here? Who do you know? Uh, and, and yeah, it'll be a little bit difficult, but you at first, then it gets really easy. That's the thing about places like Nicaragua is that getting through that first barrier of how do I deal with these things? How do I even make those first connections? That's the hardest part. Then once you have them, you're gonna be like, okay, now I see what Scott means. This is super easy. I know loads of people, like our current maid asked us. We didn't have to go looking for her. We had a maid um, who was uh, not the best and she quit. And then we hired kind of through a service, a part-time person um, just to get us through for a little while. <laughs> and we act like we, we would fall apart without a maid, but that's kind of true. And uh, so we had someone that we liked, but they were just here for like a like quarter time, just enough to like keep the house clean, not enough to like do anything. And um, that was okay. But we were able to then look at our leisure and someone we knew really well who had worked with us for years, but not as a maid came to us and said, look, I'd really, you know, I'm really stressed out with the job that I have now. I, you know, we're really good friends. I'd really love to come work for you in your home. That would solve a lot of problems for me in my life. And, and I think it would solve a lot of problems for you. And so we just ended up after a number of years being able to make that connection and be like, this is a good situation for everyone. And so that's how we ended up finding the person that we have now. Um, so at first it was very difficult for sure. And uh, we mostly went to, uh, you know, we rely very heavily on our lawyer. That's, I think, a common thing. If you have a good lawyer, you're doing a lot of business uh, or just a lot of, you know, activity, you're likely to have a lawyer that you talk to on a regular basis and they can be a really good resource for things. Now, to some degree, I'm just really lucky that I have a lawyer who is a really good resource for a lot of things. So that's one aspect of that. You may have someone else in your ecosystem that very quickly becomes a, um, I got a guy, guy for you, in my case, a uh, girl, <laughs> but, um, you know, someone you're you're going to meet people in your community who are always like, oh, you know, I got a guy who's who's looking to be a driver. I I know someone who's looking to be a maid. Oh, so and so is looking to get rid of their maid, but they're very happy with her. You should grab her, you know, now like work something out so that she can start with you when she's done with them. That kind of stuff, and it can it can be pretty easy. So on day one, yeah, very hard, and it's gonna be hard to get someone who wants to work for you on day one until you've established yourself a little bit. People are gonna be very wary of working for a foreigner um, unless they you know, are approaching it as a part-time or, or a short-term thing. Like, I'm out of work. I'm looking for something. I'll do this while I'm looking. Like, okay, make, make you know, help make ends meet. That's cool. Uh, but if you want, and, and presumably you want someone who's full-time and permanent and eventually becomes part of your family, which is very much where we are now. We're now at a point where all the people who work in our house very much are family. And, um, but that took a long time. We've had some people that we really liked over the years. Some left because they wanted to go on to university and you know move on into a career above housekeeping or whatever. And and some just it didn't end up being what they wanted to do. Some weren't really good at what they did. And so we've had different things over the years. And and we've tried people out who were like very young and it was their first job. And it's like okay, we'll give them a shot because they knew somebody. And and like maybe they didn't work out. But um, 
it's uh it's a it's a little bit of a process and it'll be different for every person so unfortunately there's not a simple like oh i just go to indeed and find you know it doesn't work that way it, it really is community and word of mouth and and who you know so as with most things in nicaragua right work really hard at making local friends whether they're professional or just your neighbors or uh expats, everyone, right? The more of a community you have, the more of those resources are going to be available. And now if I needed another maid, if it was like a pressing thing, yeah, I'd go to the same people I've talked to before, but I also have loads of friends that I could reach out to, expats and Nicaraguans, very quickly and be like, hey, do you know who would be available? And we, you know, realistically, we always have a list of people who are like, ah, should you ever be looking? I'd love to do this uh, or whatever. So those things are out there. So earlier I introduced... Uh, Mr. Orange is Pickles. I don't know why I did that. He was, that's clearly Mr. Orange. This is Pickles right here. And he still has his tag on him. I don't know why I need to take that off, but he's, uh, this is Pickles and normally lives on this side, just didn't have the light on him today. But the reason I bring up Mr. Pickles is today I got a Mr. Pickles mouse pad. It's not Mr. Pickles. He's just Pickles. Uh, but now we have the matching mouse pad so that, uh, that we have a little bit more connection to him. I just wanted to show that off. Our final question comes from Irma Palacios, 6911. Scott, are you happy in Nicaragua? So this one for my regular viewers, I think is going to seem like an odd question. Wow, what a thing to ask Scott of all people who's like the happiest person living in Nicaragua ever. And uh, that is a little bit, but for people who don't watch and haven't been watching for years and don't know me personally and think it may just be a show, um, yes. I mean, the, the easy answer is, yeah, absolutely, we're happy living in Nicaragua. But why? What, you know, there's lots of reasons why we like it. And I think that, um, and obviously the question is happy, right? Now why we chose it, what, what makes us happy here? And there's a lot of things, right? But the biggest thing is, you know, we love our friends here and the community and, um, you know, we've become a part of this place and we like what everyday life brings for us here. We like um, what it's like interacting with the community and how how well we can spend, to, for me, really important things, obviously spending time with my kids and my dogs and my family and friends, um, those social things, being able to, you know, work and have that work translate into a good quality of life where I get lots of time away from work, or in my case, the ability to get out of work and do other work like this show, um, <laughs> instead of just sitting in the office work, uh, you know, just having a lot of freedom to do things and, and having the income that we make from working be able to give us both a good life now and make it potentially, hopefully, really easy for us to just transition into retirement someday and, and continue to live in our community and have these deep connections. Um, and I think uh, from a community perspective, from a, a personal connections perspective, and of course these things are gonna change over time and morph and all these things, but when I was a kid growing up in the United States, in New York, uh, in Western New York, like Buffalo, um, you know, our community was really strong. And, but I never, I, you know, my family wasn't from, my parents weren't from that part of uh, the U.S. They're from Ohio. And, and they didn't have like these deep connections into the community where I was growing up. They had only moved into the community where I grew up in the first few months. Like I moved there with them when I was a few months old. So they were new when I was a, a child. And so I can remember my parents in the place where I grew up with the amount of experience in that place that I have here in Nicaragua, maybe uh, less. Uh, and, and neither of my parents were like super social. They were not like big, go out and do stuff in the community. My mother was a town clerk, so that gave her a lot of connections. But uh, my father worked very far away, so his job was in no way connected. And his commute meant that it was very hard for him to be community connected uh, beyond like church and like weekend activities. But we had a farm on top of uh, of the, the, my parents' work. And so that meant there was a lot more time at home. Like home took a lot of time because uh, there was a farm to maintain. So going out and being social in the community was not a thing. I went to a private school until I was uh, 13 and that, you know, tiny class, everyone is from different areas, no social stuff whatsoever, like just not connected to the community. So growing up in the United States, even though at the time there was this tendency of communities to be multi-generational and very strong connection to, to your community, I didn't have that uh, where I grew up. And and then never any anywhere, including where I grew up, um, which I mentioned Batavia and Arthur Treacher's earlier, 
None of these places, while when I go back, there's this unbelievable sense of, oh, I grew up here, my childhood was here, but really I feel so disconnected from those places that even as a child, I felt relatively disconnected from those places. I had a lack of uh, uh, belonging um, to where, to, to the physical location. I mean, wonderful people, like I didn't feel unwelcome. I just didn't feel like it was my place. And I kind of always, and I'm sure my father will remember when I was very young and I always dreamed of moving to California. Well, when I'm older, I'm gonna move to California. What a stupid idea. Like I've been to California. What was I thinking? I hate California. Uh, but in my defense, my father thought Colorado would be a good choice and I really hate Colorado. So not, neither of us had any idea where I would want to go. Uh, but the, uh, I think I always had this like desire for a place where I could really connect to a community where it's not just that I'm a part of the community, like that's cool, but that the people I connect with are mostly going to still be there when I'm old. And that was growing up in Western New York, there was really no expectation that the people that I met and grew up around, we were all going to move away. We were all going to be gone. And we all are. I don't have any connections to high school or, or elementary school. I have like two or three people that I still stay in contact with. Uh, and, and, you know, and they're watching this show most of the time. But th that's like, yeah, there's just a, a couple of us and none of us live that close to where we started. Um, you know, close enough that we, some of us would be able to get together if I was back there, but only like two and it would be quite a drive. Right. And everyone's busy with family and stuff. And just, just you, you tend to go your separate ways because um, you have to. Right. As, as an American, because the, just the way that, that society is structured. Being in Nicaragua, being in Leon in a smaller city, uh, there's a very strong expectation that people we met years ago, we're still going to be connected to. And in years from now, they're still going to be here. They're part of our community. And we have a pretty good reason to believe that a large number the large percentage of the people that we're friends with now are still going to be in our social group in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, because this is going to be our community and this is going to be their community. People don't just shift communities willy nilly. And we have a vision of a future here. This is where we expect to be in 30 years. And uh, this is where they expect to be in 30 years. And that's, that's new. And so we, one, have a, have a, in the moment, really strong connection with our community. Uh, now I can go out and, and I feel much more a part of this community than I ever did in the US. Um, and, and I feel like I have a much better vision for the future where the community that I'm a part of now will continue to be a very similar community that I'll be a member of then. That's an important thing for me. That gives me a lot of happiness. Um, and, and just general, like this really good community that I like being a part of adds a lot to happy. Of course, being safe, a uh, great place to raise our kids. My kids want to stay here or nearby. Um, uh, the, the cost of living, of course, means there's just so much less to go wrong. We all talk about cost of living and there's a certain amount of like, ah, we're just being cheap or whatever. And, and certainly in the moment, there's a lot of, I just don't want pay to, I don't want to pay as much for a hamburger as I used to. So that makes me happy here. Obviously that's true. A place costing less seems like a silly thing to describe, but I think a lot of people when they're, when they're talking about it really get caught up in the, you know, just like a tax break. Oh, I'm not, I don't have to pay as many taxes. And that's like, yes, I get to keep some more of my money. It's more like, it feels like vindication. Now I can go buy an extra whatever I was going to buy, right? More gadgets and widgets and what's it's. But when you're really living a lifestyle like this, one of the things that we value heavily is that should we go through financial distress or major life upheavals, doing that in the United States, which we have done, right? We've been through many major life stages as uh, my wife and I together, we've been more than 20 years, uh, married and even more since we started dating, right? We've been through unemployment. We've been through career changes. We've been through uh, moving around the country. We've been through international moves. We've been through having children. Um, you know, we've been through these big things and we've been through major business disasters where we lost everything. Um, like really dramatic things from a financial perspective. And being in the United States, weathering those storms is very difficult. And, and the same thing in Nicaragua would be so much easier to weather because the day to day expenses, what, what, you know, if you need to pull back and go to austerity, that austerity budget is going to be so much more powerful 
in, in one way, it's you can live so much better on a really tight budget while you rebuild your life or figure out what you're going to do or just try to hold on. And on the other hand, it's you're able to pull back so much more. So if in the United States, you're like, we're going to austerity, we're going to try to live and not spend more than $15,000 a year. In Nicaragua, you might be like, okay, we're going to pull back and we're going to try to not spend more than half that, $7,500 a year. And even at $7,500 per year in Nicaragua, you're probably going to live noticeably better than trying to live at $15,000 in the U.S. And if something goes wrong and you have just a little bit of extra expense, you have to deal with something that, that you just couldn't budget for, chances are in Nicaragua that that item is not going to be that big. And in the United States, the risk that it's going to be a sudden $100,000 item is, is much higher. There's just the, the ability for there to be sudden very large bills. Of course, healthcare is the first thing we all think of, but there's other potential things, insurance or fines or whatever. We never are in Nicaragua and, and hear about someone getting a $10,000 fine because of something, you, you know, just, oh, normal life. I didn't do some paperwork I didn't think about. I have a $10,000 fine. Never hear about anything like that. In the United States, literally, you know, we've gotten sudden $120,000 fines multiplied multiple times, enormous numbers that are just mind boggling. And you're like, <clears throat> these are these are crazy. How can you have fines so large as something that you have no way to know? And it's just wow, right? Those risks, they're not common. But these are real world things that happen to me and lots of people that I know, right? Real things that have come up and and avoiding that. And and just being able to say, wow, we're gonna go to a really tiny budget and we can live acceptably well for the indefinite future is an important bit of safety, even if you never have to use it, knowing that it's there, knowing that you could pull back instantly and survive the most unbelievable things. And if you then need to go out and find work, you need to, whatever you have to do in your life, you have to get family to help support you. Well, a little bit of family support goes a long way. Here, you become remittance. If you uh, have to go find work, well, the ability to find part-time work or low pay work that's going to make your lifestyle here quite comfortable versus in the United States, so much easier. There's just so many little things like that. Those things give a quality of life benefit, even if you're not leveraging them. That lower cost of living protects you in important ways that you don't realize. Now, of course, Nicaraguans are not affected by that in the same way because they are also affected by Nicaraguan income rates at the same time. But as an expat, we're not, we're not affected by that aspect of things. We're not able to work here, but we are able to work abroad. So we have a pay rate from abroad, but a cost of living from here. That combination gives us a lot of protection that other people don't get. But when you, when you step back and look at all the reasons that go together, right? weather and food and transportation and opportunities for life and protection of my children, all these different things as a whole, um, you know, it's easy to give the answer. Yeah, we're, we're happy in Nicaragua. And it's easy for people to question that. Oh, um, you know, why? Why would we believe that you're happy there? And I think the really, really, really obvious answer, and this is so demonstrable, Right. Of course, there could be some reason why this is not true, but it's so unbelievably likely to be demonstrated by this. And that is, uh, especially you, you can watch my channel. You can go back and see footage from uh, 2012, from 2015, and look at uh, whether it's this channel or just at Scott L. Miller, and you can see our time backpacking Europe. You can see us living in Spain and living in Panama and living in Nicaragua and living in Italy and living in Greece and living in, and, and in Romania did a lot of footage in Romania. And, and you can see that we really, really tried living all over and, and sampled a lot of things and got a lot of experience. And of course, we're able to live in the US and, um, and, and you see where I live here, right? On the show, you know that, you know, can I live the same in the US? No, but clearly I lived in the US for a really long time. I lived in Europe. I lived all over. We're living here. We're living well here. Um, I have a business. I have a job. Right? I'm, not, I'm not in a position where I'm trying to figure out how to make money from Nicaragua. That is not at all happening. I don't have that, that drive. So there's nothing, right? Like if I was 
pulling in income from Nicaragua, you could easily be like, oh, you're not happy, but this is, you're, you're tied to this financially. I'm not tied to Nicaragua um, in a way that would prevent me from leaving. Of course, I'm tied emotionally, right? I've invested effort. My family wants to be here. My dogs are here. My kids are here. My family's here. But uh, we rent this house and we have moved many times before. Our ability to move to another country is essentially unlimited. That's not entirely true, but it's about as good as anyone has. We have the experience, we have the resources, and given our passports and visas and other things, we can move to any number of really nice, attractive countries at the drop of a hat. Within one week, I could be at something like 100 to 120 different countries with the ability to at least have a long-term stay, if not a permanent one. And almost all of those, that long-term could turn into a permanent or semi-permanent. Our ability to move somewhere else is about as, as easy as it could possibly be. So every single day, we get to ask ourselves, are we so happy with Nicaragua that we would choose it? Now, maybe there's a day where it's like, you know what? I would, if I could, I could just be somewhere else. But it's only barely better, so little barely better that it's not worth going there. We're already in a place so good that ah, I don't want to take the risk. I don't want to put in the effort because it's at best about break even. If I need to move for some reason, okay, no problem. But is it enough better to push me over the edge? Clearly not, because if it was, I would go. Right, I'm not in Nicaragua because I'm trapped somehow. And, and it's easy to show this, right? I was just in Argentina. I was just in Panama. I was just in Costa Rica. I was just in the United States. I was just in Mexico. I could have stayed in essentially any one of those and many places nearby I could have stayed. And my ability to leave Nicaragua is easy to demonstrate. Oh, I was in Belize recently, and I was in Guatemala recently, and I was in El Salvador recently. I've been a lot of places in the last several months, and then Bolivia um, almost a year ago, uh, and, and Peru. Did I mention Peru? Um, so I've been to, and I've been in and out of Nicaragua all these times. So my ability to leave is easily demonstrable. I make episodes from other places. And my ability to return, easily demonstrable, because you see me here all the time. And, and so knowing that not only am I not leaving, or I'm not permanently leaving, but I'm going to places that are really attractive. Guatemala, Mexico, Argentina, right? I'm in places that it's very easy to make a good, compelling argument for that. And, and for many of my audience are places that you're going to want, right? Some of my audience are not going to pick Nicaragua. That's just reality, right? And I don't mean that they're not going to pick it like, wow, we decided not to move. That happens too. But I mean, they're going to evaluate Nicaragua. It's probably why they're watching. And I'm going to say, oh, this was great, but eh, it was too hot. Eh, I didn't like the food variety. Eh, it just didn't vibe with me. Whatever. And they are going to look at one of these places that I mentioned. Mexico, Argentina, especially right now. And they're going to say, oh, this, this I love. Big city or uh, different climate, it gets snows, I can go skiing, there's mountains, I can go to right, whatever it is that, that's gonna drive them. And, and, and I'm in places where really easily those people are going to pick as their first choice. And I'm going there and saying, this is wonderful, I love this, I love Buenos Aires, I love Panama City, I love San Jose, I love Guatemala City, um, Mazatlan was fantastic, right? Cancun was not exactly drawing me back. But I mean, these places, I could just stay. I am choosing to return to Nicaragua. I understand I need to go get my luggage, pack up my family, get up there. But that's not that hard. And we're in those places. So the fact that every day we are waking up in Nicaragua and choosing Nicaragua, it's when you're an expat, being in a country is like being in a relationship. And you have your rocky days, and you have your great days, and you, you have some effort to breaking up, right? But you can do it. But it's like, well, yeah, I'm not going to do that at a drop of a hat. It's too big of a life change. Totally understood. That's probably how it should be. But for a relationship to work, you have to 
wake up every day and say, this is a relationship I want to be in. I want to continue in this relationship. And if you have day after day where you're like, nope, this isn't doing it for me, that's a bad situation. But when you're in a relationship, it's like, well, you have to break up and then maybe you find someone else. You have this high likelihood of being relationshiplessness, of being relationshipless. And when you're talking about countries, you can't really, you can't really give up a place to live and just float on a boat. It's not 100% true, you kind of can, but in general, you're always going to have somewhere to go or be going somewhere. But you don't have this like, well, I have to find somewhere, I have to talk them into it. I mean, kind of you do, but basically you end up just going to a place, right? I'm here in Nicaragua, I want to go to Honduras. Well, I just head to the border, cross the border. And yes, they can say no. Yes, I had to select to go there. But basically, we know they're going to let us in. We know how to get there. It, it's very straightforward. It's not like going up to someone at the bar and hoping that they return your interest. You basically can go to any of hundreds of countries, uh, or more than 100 countries at least, and, and just go. Right? So like a good healthy relationship where all the parties wake up and Nicaragua does the same thing. Nicaragua wakes up in the morning and says, well, another good day with Scott. Hopefully he stays. That'd be nice. Right? It's, it's both sides have this healthy daily. We're all happy. This is where we want to be. It's good for everyone. And, and if anything, if, you know, if that relationship goes bad, you can move on. And as expats, it is so easy for us to move on. So that I am here. I think is the strongest demonstration that I want to be here. I would only be here because I was happy. And if, if this stops making me happy, I'm out of here, right? That's just obvious, I think, to people who understand if you've been an expat. If you've never been an expat, it's really easy to not see that and be like, it's such a big deal moving to a new country. Sure, when you haven't done it yet, but if, once you've done it, you'll be like, oh, it's easy. Any given country may have some red tape or paperwork or whatever, uh, or limitations. But in general, the act of moving to a new country is like, okay, the fear isn't doing it the first time. This is an easy thing. I could do it again. I could do it again. Absolutely. So once you understand how easy that is, then it's easy to see, oh, every day I'm, I'm making this conscious decision. This is my home. I want this to continue being my home. And every day there's a, oh, I remember the islands in Greece. Boy, did I love it. Oh, I remember the rain in Romania. Oh, I remember the views on the mountain in Spain. I remember how handy the airport was in Panama. Oh, I really liked visiting Argentina and Buenos Aires just, just a few weeks ago. All these memories are there. And there's so many places I want to go and visit and haven't had a chance. Oh, I really want to check out Zanzibar and see what, what it's like living there. Or maybe go, go out onto the, the plains and, and see the wide open inter, uh, African plain areas. Get down to Malawi. I really want to see what the, you know, the Scottish weather is like in the highlands of Malawi and go check out the lake with the world's greatest fish diversity. Amazing stuff, right? And stuff's always calling me. And sometimes I go visit places. But that call, that wanderlust, that, that desire to go to places that are so wonderful, that's there. My happiness in Nicaragua is a magnetic force holding me from zipping off to the next interesting place immediately. Right. And, and, and everyone has this, but a lot of people have this momentum thing of like, I'm stationary. I don't know how to move. I don't know that I can move. I don't know what I would do. I'm scared. I don't have any fear of going to another place. I have none at all. I've done it so much that even before I started doing it, I really wasn't very, it was like, ah, this seems like it'd be a really simple thing. What can go wrong? People do this, right? I must be able to do this. But now having done it, having visited so many countries and constantly visiting more and, and having moved so many places, the idea that I would worry at all, I barely would plan. If we had to move to another country, basically I let my wife pack and we'd casually talk about it and we'd just be off. It, it's honestly that easy. Uh, and so that, that is a demonstration. That is why uh, I don't think a lot of people ask that because when you see uh, that I'm choosing it every day, it's like, oh, that is definitely making him happy, right? And of course there's reasons that I might need to leave that are not basically, you know, we've had to move for family emergencies before. That's obviously not a happy reason to be moving. Uh, there are exceptions, but in day-to-day -day life, the fact that we're here where we don't have family, we don't have anything drawing us here other than our love of being in the country. Um, that's, uh, that's the best indicator we're going to get.
All right, so I hope that that answers that question. I did a bit of recording uh, now, but while we we're there, I already showed some of the drive that we did from uh, the outskirts of um, of Managua, um, coming in from Via de Carmen, and entering the city. We were not exactly, we didn't exactly show Via de Carmen itself as we entered the city, but we did show uh, an area coming from there, right, on, on the Carretera Vieja, uh, which comes in and then we turn as we come into Managua, and we went down the, the Pista Suburbana, and uh, that uh, is an important drive. We went to the, the uh, Galerias Santa Domingo. So I want to now show a little bit of the drive as we go the other way. So I'm actually going to go from the Carretera Messiah right in front of Price Mart. So this is nearly in the city of Messiah uh, or close to Nindiri. And so if you look on a map and find the Price Mart on the Carretera Messiah on the southeast side of Managua, we're going northwest. I'm going to take you through the middle of the city. We're going to go to the uh, Rotunda Central America. We're going to head west on the Pista Suburbana, so we're going to retrace our steps a little bit. But when we get over to the west side of the city, instead of going south, go take the Carretera Vieja. We're going to go north to take the Carretera Nueva. Did I say it right? Vieja in the south, Nueva in the north. And we're going to go through Ciudad Sandino and Metaare and Nagarote and La Paz Centro. And hopefully this turns out well for the video. So without further ado, Let's do a little drive through Managua. And we're right in front of Price Mart right here. There's also a McDonald's. Unfortunately, it was raining, but it didn't rain that much on the drive. It was just a little bit. But this is the Carretera Messiah heading northwest into downtown uh, Managua. But we've got a ways to go. The Price Mart is pretty far out, actually. It's, it's past Plaza Once. It's past the Walmart. And I can't see the signs uh, on this video fast enough, so I can't tell you exactly uh, what all we are we are passing. But this is what traffic is like out on the Carretera. And it's it was not bad. This is actually right at the start of rush hour, so this is pretty good. That was the rotunda at the Galerias. Now we're coming up into the rotunda Central America. This one is actually weird. There's part that goes, there's part of the highway goes under the rotunda, and then part goes up to it, and that is the Edificio Central America right there that we just passed. Limoncello is just off on the left. Now we're on the Pisa Suburbana, uh, heading west across the city. So the former rotunda, the one I didn't take at the Galerias, that's where Jean-Paul Jeanne comes in, um, which is a pretty major road, but the Suburbana is really the, the, the defining road on the south side of the city. And by about the point we're at now, everything off to the left is actually kind of mountains and, and forest for the most part. Obviously against the road there's buildings, but behind them uh, there's kind of a hill, so it really drops off pretty quickly. Uh, and to the right is all of the city. And we're pretty close to coming through the Barrio San Judas, which people have talked about on the channel a bit, that they, they feel like it's a really scary area. So I really want to go out and walk that uh, with my buddy David, because he grew up there, and, and he's like, oh, it's totally safe. We'll go walk and we'll go visit people I know and, and see the area. I think it'd be a lot of fun. So I need to go do that, because I really want to show more of the quote-unquote dangerous Managua uh, that people are so, you know, scared of to show what it's actually like. And you can see there's a lot of green space out here. Um, there is a little bit of trash that you can see, unfortunately, on the road, but it's uh, it's pretty nice. That was the Plaza Le Fay, right there on the right, and now we're heading north on, I actually don't know the name of the road, go down a little rotunda, and then we're going to take the overpass. We're now turning, this is now officially, once we hit the overpass, we're on the Carretera Nueva, uh, and we're heading towards Leon. But it's going to take a while. This is a pretty long drive. All in all, it's just over two hours from where we were at Price Mart out to Leon, uh, depending on traffic. But two hours is really good. We're coming through Ciudad Sandino right here. That's all of this built up area along here. All of that is Ciudad Sandino. It is an unbelievably large suburb slash independent city uh, as part of the, the Managua area. Now we're moving through really fast, so I'm doing my best to try to track where we are. It is very difficult. Once we get out on the open road, uh, we should be around about Meta Are. Can't tell if we already blew through it or are just coming up on it. 
Well, this is a really nice drive in general. I, I like the, especially I like the, the kit, uh, that's Matt Dari right there. Uh, I like the, uh, the, the, the North Road, the, the Nueva, because it goes along the lake and it goes through a lot of small cities and there's just more to see and do. Uh, on on this route, going this route, going the the south route, the old route, Vieja. Um, there's really no stops. There's no gas stations. There is a little bit, but very very little. Um, but this way has modern places to uh, uh, stop and get drinks. You use the bathroom, get snacks. Lots of restaurants, um, built up areas. It's it's pretty nice. Unfortunately, the windshield isn't completely clean. I did my best. Uh, and you're out driving for a long period of time. It is what it is. And there's a lot of sun glare, so not the best video. I apologize for that. We're going to pull into Nagarote here and stop and get a soda. Boom, got it. And we're off again. That was the super, the, the AM PM that's open 24 hours there that I stopped at. So we're going to head through Nagarote and out into the countryside. And this is now the space between Nagarote and La Paz Centro. This is one of my favorite stretches uh, in the air. Just gorgeous off both sides. You got these great hedgerows. You can see volcanoes off to the right, not on this video, but when you're driving. And while we were doing this, we could see big storm off to the, to the right. Uh, we saw big lightning strikes and you could see that there was rain, but we did okay the whole way back. Uh, the, the storm hit once we were home. Um, but what a beautiful drive. Just great country up there. It's, it's amazing. Uh, a little rotunda in the middle of nowhere that goes off to uh, Puerto Sandino and uh, Leon Vieja. This is right there. That's La Paz Centro that we're coming through, which also has uh, new stuff, a new AM PM to stop at. New park went in, just like you guys see in Nagarote. And now we're in the wide open space between La Paz Centro and the uh, M. Palma Isapa, which is where we're going to make a turn onto Leon's Road itself. While we're doing this drive, I'm just going to do the wrap-up stuff. If, uh, if you guys would be so kind as to make sure while we're doing this, hit that like button. Uh, that should have been a Zappa right there. Uh, so um, hit that like. If you haven't subscribed, be sure to do that for sure. If you want to support the channel, you're able to do, we've got two major ways to do it. One is buying me a coffee. So we'll put the link up on the screen. It's buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. It's like Patreon comes directly to me. And thank you so much for everyone who supports us. It makes such a big difference. It is very expensive doing this. And, uh, and I, you know, it's a passion project and certainly doesn't make any money, but the offset that you guys provide is very important for us and, and emotionally very meaningful, right? It, it helps us. Uh, it really helps my wife especially understand how much uh, the show is appreciated. And a quick shout out to Josh and Karen who stopped by and saw us while we were in Managua today. They ran into us at Muggs. They were walking by Muggs uh, Coffee Bar and, he, and Josh looks in the window and I could see he kind of had recognition in his eyes and was suddenly like, hey, that's the guy we've been watching before we came. Uh, so he stopped in and, and took a selfie and, and said hi. So shout out to them. It's great meeting you guys. Thanks for coming out. And a uh, reminder, we do have memberships for people. This is Leon. That was Leon Stadium. You can see we're coming through. Uh, we do have the new membership system for anyone who's interested. We've got 14 members now. I'd really like to see that get up to 20. That would be amazing. Uh, that's a small monthly fee, just automatic and is, you know, no real benefits other than our secret chat room, but it does really help support the channel in an ongoing predictable way, which really does help us out a lot. But that is about it for us. So that's where the camera was cutting off. We actually had a number of police checkpoints as we came through. I have no idea what they're looking for, but they were checking for bicycles and all kinds of things uh, before we got back. But we beat the rain. It was a good drive. I hope you enjoyed the little extra footage we put there at the end. And I will see all of you tomorrow.